the provincial nominee program with a focus on Ontario, common misconceptions um, and errors that are made with these applications, and lastly, COVID-19 related updates, the, the more recent ones at least. Family Sponsorship is a foundational immigration program that honors the importance of family reunification in Canada. Prior to the 1960s, this was the main source of migration to Canada. Although the attention has been switched over to economic-based programs, the stream is, of migration to Canada is still very viable. To be sponsored as a family member, you must be in one of these four, a spouse, common law, or conjugal partner of a Canadian citizen or permanent resident. And just to give an idea of what conjugal means, it's when you guys are in a marriage-like relationship or common law type of relationship, but it is in separate countries. So common law, the foundation is for you to be residing together and conjugal honors the fact that for whatever circumstances, you're not able to live or reside in the same household, but that foundation of your relationship being marriage-like um, is still genuine. But of course, you got to prove it. Secondly, a dependent child who is 22 and under, including adopted children of a Canadian citizen or permanent resident, a parent or grandparent of a Canadian citizen or a permanent resident. And lastly, any relative of a Canadian citizen or, or a permanent resident when there is no other family member residing in Canada. So this is like a special little area that's not really publicized as much. It is for the person who is in Canada, been here for a long time and actually has no surviving family members or they don't have anybody that is able to be sponsored so they could choose a further family relative, for example, a cousin or a niece, which wouldn't fall under the terms of a family member based on family sponsorship. That being said, all family member relationships must be proven as genuine with varying supporting documents that validate your relationship. For example, a marriage certificate alone is not sufficient to prove a marriage relationship. So for example, some supporting documents that you could consider is photos, which we know it says it on the checklist, include 20 photos maximum, but it's really about the content of those photos and the quality. So you wanna be able to get uh, friends, events that you're at, not just you and your partner together, but kind of an inclusive environment and the development of your relationship. So you might have photos from when you guys first met, down to the point that you guys got married and even after while you're preparing everything. As well, you can include social media, if you content, if that's what you guys are on, letters from family and friends. So it's not just to show like the bank statements and the insurance, those are all viable, but you wanna show a little bit more substance towards that relationship, although you have a marriage certificate. Now, the first step of the process is determine if the sponsor is eligible to sponsor the spouse, partner, or a child. Eligibility requirements are you must be 18 years of age or older, you're a Canadian citizen or a permanent resident of Canada or registered in Canada as an Indian under the Canadian Indian Act. If you are a Canadian citizen and you're living outside of Canada, you must show proof of your plan to reside in Canada once the permanent resident application is approved for your partner or whomever it is that you're sponsoring. For a permanent resident, this isn't an option for you. Some may ask, well, permanent residents don't live outside of the country because of their residency obligations. But if you are a permanent resident who is working for a company outside of Canada, for a Canadian company outside of Canada, like maybe you're working for Air Canada in the US, and you had married somebody there and you would like to sponsor them, you would have to wait till you return to Canada in order to do so. So I hope that's very clear. Um, you must be able to prove that you are able, that you are not receiving social assistance uh, for any reason other than disability. You can provide, you must be able to show that you can provide the basic needs of any person you want to sponsor. Now you cannot sponsor if you don't have the ability to meet the requirements above. And if you have a permanent resident application still processing, seems like it may be a funny question to say that, but some people have a PR application and they wanna sponsor somebody else. 
you would have to list that person on your application for PR that's processing if you're eligible to do so. Or wait till you've received your PR and then you could go about sponsoring a family member. Now you might not be eligible to sponsor and we say may not be eligible because in some circumstances it may you may have the ability to. Um, so if you are sponsored by someone less than five years ago yourself, if you're still responsible for a previous undertaking, so that means you sponsored someone before and your responsibility is not over. If you're in jail or a penitentiary, if you did not pay back immigration alone, a performance bond or a court order family sponsorship, spot, uh, family support, so child support for example, fail to honor financial support for a previous sponsorship, declare bankruptcy and are not discharged, receiving social assistance other than disability, convicted of attempting, threatening to attempt or committing a violent offense, um, any offense against a relative, any sexual offense inside or outside of Canada, or if you're under a removal order yourself. So some of the areas here which are kind of touch and go is because if you have a conviction, but for example, that could have been more than 10 years ago and you were deemed rehabilitated or you applied for rehabilitation, which is separate from a pardon, but you're rehabilitated, you may have committed a crime or been convicted of, but it's no longer um, pressing on your record that way, you should be able to do a sponsorship. Some people get into the situation where they submitted the application and then a criminal situation occurs. If you have to kind of go through that process, they may put your application on hold to see what the result or the outcome is and then allow you to further proceed. Some people are on social assistance and then they come off of it while the application is still in. And so it depends on the case officer to determine if they're gonna allow the application to go through because you now meet the requirements. An interesting fact is that immigration would still like the sponsor to prove that they have a genuine parental relationship with a child. Some people don't really uh, consider this. Once you're on the birth certificate, they're assuming, yes, we're fine. But that's not really the case. They want to, especially when the child is getting older, they want to prove that there's a foundational uh, parental relationship there, which could be photos that you can include. Maybe if you are a contact person for anything with their school, maybe the doctor has your name on record, uh, money that you help to send to support the child. Those are great documents that you can include in your application to strengthen that genuine relationship. Um, also, this is great information for anybody. Um, if you are, if you are, this is like a new family sponsorship pilot. So if you or anybody that you know has a undeclared family member, so that means they would have had a sponsorship in before, or maybe they obtained permanent residency before, and they never included maybe their children or they didn't include a spouse or they didn't include a parent's information. So these are those immediate family members. If they were not included in that previous application, then the good news is um, you have until September 9th, 2021. So that's this year, September 20, September 9th to submit this application. So you're able to now put in a sponsorship for your child if you had not declared it. And it's very interesting, a lot of people are in this situation, hence why they've made this pilot program. Um, many have not declared a family member for whatever reasons, maybe they didn't know the person existed or they would have affected their application from the onset. And so they took the chance and said, I'll just work on an option for them after the fact. But take advantage if this applies to you or I encourage you to tell someone else that this even exists so that they can also use this information. Another important aspect of Canadian immigration is the economic class programs. These include streams to become a permanent resident based on the labor market and business, such as federal skilled workers. Within this category, I'll be focusing on the caregiver pilot program that launched June 4th, 2019, and will be closing June 4th, 2024 and the provincial nominee program with a focus on Ontario. First up, let's get into the caregiver program. 
So caregivers have been a consistent stream of migration into Canada for several decades. Um, what we find different about this program is the requirement for higher education and language capabilities compared to the previous. And at this time, I'm going to go through or share the requirements of this program and the changes. So as you can see on the slide, as it's pulling up here, there are the previous caregiver program requirements. You know, it relates to education, but I'm going to focus on the pilot program and we'll just do that comparison. So we know that there is a minimum of one year college diploma compared to the latter program. This is much higher and the language assessment you have to do now. It was never required before. So you would just have to show proof of a document that you have language um, abilities in English, French or both. Um, now you have to be able to show a minimum score of five, which is very doable for a lot of people. Um, another is a minimum one year experience within the field, which is consistent. And you can also show this experience in your educational background. So maybe you had done training in early childhood education, for example, or nursing and something in that capacity. Um, the job offer must be completed. Uh, this is a really great change because in the previous program you needed a labor market impact assessment and some people are still of that impression but you don't uh, you just so you don't have to advertise you don't have to go for the long processing time you really just need an employer who's willing to give you that genuine job offer and to sign off on the form with certain information it's very clear so if you want to approach somebody some of the information that would be on there is their address information as well as who the care is going to be provided for how much you're willing to offer in terms of salary how many hours how often will this be paid on a weekly or bi-weekly pay payment period stuff like that they're very standard um, but that's just about it and then you submit that with your full application another aspect that i am just so excited about and it's because of Coming from the old program, I saw all the hitches and the issues that it had for people. It is now having the open work permit um, in terms of your employer. So previously it was for Jane Doe and Jane Doe is your employer. If you wanna change it, you have to go through the six month LMIA process again, then wait for immigration to approve your work permit change. Now you're able to, if it doesn't work out with um, Jane Doe, you're able to go to uh, Billy Jane, <laughs> just to give us a, a, a name, but if it doesn't work out with one, then you can always get hired by somebody else. You get hired by more than one person in order to maintain and keep on track of your work experience needed within Canada. Another, again, amazing aspect that is different is family accompaniment. So families are now issued a work permit and a study permit so they can remain with you for the length of your employment. In previous applications, the family was separated and it would be sometimes for maybe five, six years, which had a lot of impact on families. Um, just that separation was really hard and the ability to travel back and forth is just not there, it's not as viable. So them considering that, you know what, the person can flourish, it's a live out position, you know, let's have their family come and contribute to the labor market. Let's get their children here so that they can integrate faster. Like these are great options to keep people together and kind of develop themselves inside of Canada until they get their permanent residence. So lastly, kind of about the change or a second last would be the pre-approval versus having to wait at the end. So now when you submit your application from the onset, you're gonna know if you're pre-approved for permanent residency. And this also makes once you're finished the 24, um, 24 months of work experience that you can prove and you submit that transition for them to give you your permanent residence is a lot faster. So prior to, it may take over a year to two years to get that actual permanent resident document. Now um, they're, rush they're looking at around six months or less for you to be able to get it. So they've really done their diligence in terms of speeding up the process for people. So I'm really happy about that. Um, lastly, one of the changes is the CIC fees. So in the previous program, a lot of people had to just pay their fee. So on the next slide, you'll see that there is processing fees there. And 
the ones for your work permit as a caregiver was the only ones that you would need to present when getting into the program. Now you have to actually do the processing fees as you could see them listed here, you know, 550, 150, and this is like per adult. So let's say you're a family of five, this can kind of increase a lot and you have to pay this from the very beginning. Um, uh, one of those things just to like to give some information on is the biometric fee. So if you're 13 and over, you need to pay this fee. Um, it's basically uh, fingerprinting, eye scan, face recognition. Um, Canada requires everybody to do it once you're entering Canada for longer. Um, no, once you're entering Canada, period. <laughs> and so therefore, if it is a family, they have made it a combined fee of 170. So two or more people, you just pay 170. So if it's five of you guys, you're fine. Um, but I just want you to bear in mind that this is the type of application if you're going to pursue, there's some upfront fees that are a bit top heavy compared to before. Now, the caregiver program has two streams so that you're clear. There's the child caregiver provider and the home support worker, and they'll be accepting a maximum of 2,750 principal applicants each stream for a total of 5,500 per year. So it's not inclusive of like your family, but just the principal applicant is where they're counting these numbers. And just a reminder, this program is closing in 2024. Uh, pilot programs can be extended and modified based on the success of the program or the need for the program. So we might find out after 2024 that it's gonna be put in place permanently, or there may be a few tweaks. But because we don't know what's ultimately gonna happen at that point, it makes sense to take advantage of it now while you can. Now, this program is a great way for persons in Canada to help qualifying family members and friends come to Canada to obtain permanent residency. Now I say that because if you know someone who is intending to hire a caregiver, um, and they're struggling, they're not able to find somebody, and you have a family or friend maybe outside of the country that has the experience and really would love the opportunity, then you can make that referral. Don't be afraid to do so. Or maybe it's your family and you have the job offer. You can feel free to extend that. It is an option for you. Next, I would like to touch on our fourth uh, key area for today, which is the provincial nominee program. Canada has immigration options on federal levels and provincial levels. So this allows provinces to determine and meet their specific needs, such as a shortage in the labor market. Although each province and territory is different, there are similarities in the category. So you will find as you go from province to province that there's specific things that kind of come up a lot. For example, high skill positions, job offer oriented, healthcare positions, international student category, business. So these are recurring um, streams. So this is great for international students who have been postgraduate work permit holders, and it allows them to kind of start with a company in a different province right away uh, because their permit is open and they don't have to wait until that offer comes into play. Today, I'll be going deeper into the province of Ontario. Presently, they have the following program. So they're still accepting applications for the PhD graduate stream, French speaking skilled worker stream, human capital streams, priority stream, and the skilled trade stream and entrepreneur stream. Presently, we have closed, but they will be reopening this year, the in-demand skill stream, foreign worker stream, international student stream, and the master's graduate stream. These can all be found on the Ontario Immigrant Nominee Program website, which I believe they are going to include that in the chat for you. So you can expect to see it there and click on it and get some more information. Ontario, along with other provinces, obtain a certain amount of nomination certificates that are issued to the client to submit a permanent resident application. The quota for the closed programs have been met for 2020, so you just have to wait until it refreshes and changes. So what I would suggest for people who meet the requirements of the closed ones is to kind of get all of what you need prepared, the letters, the documents, um, the supporting documents that you need 
get those together, have them saved on your USB. And then as soon as that portal opens, you just get yourself in the application and you go forward from that. All right. Um, in the open programs, though, I find many questions about the entrepreneur stream. And uh, many of people are of the understanding that an entrepreneur, because it's a word that we use so common, but we consider an entrepreneur to be someone who is self-employed. So regardless of the capacity and how much you earn, as long as you're self-employed, this may be an option for you. That's what a lot of people are thinking. But I want to give clarity on the requirements and the eligibility for such programs, for this program specifically. Um, requirements to qualify. So there's a certain amount of business experience that you have to have. So you have to be working full time, uh, had experience for about two years within the last 60 months. But the highlighted areas on the list that you could see on the slide is your net worth, your personal investment funds, job creation. These things are what kind of separates the entrepreneur um, definition for the nomination you have to have a certain amount of capital. So 800,000 Canadian dollars if you're within the GTA and you have to have 400,000 if you are outside of the GTA in terms of the business that you're about to start or what you're considering to start. And you have to invest into this business 600,000 if you're inside and 200,000 if you're outside. And there is an exemption for people in the technology stream if field, then you're able to do 200,000 regardless of where you are. You have to actively be involved in the business on an ongoing basis. It has to turn a profit and you have to be able to have job creation for Canadians and permanent residents. So that's what kind of makes this entrepreneur stream a little different. Um, a certain group of people uh, really can utilize this program. So one of the streams, if this applies to you or someone you know, then I would say there is a link that I believe they may put in there for you to be able to check that out. Um, but last, in order to go through with this, so if this seems viable for you, you must initiate the process by sending an interest, expression of interest, which is known as an EOI. Um, so to register, you would have to, and the information I believe, yes, it's coming up, it is right there. So an email has to be sent, you need to complete the registration form, and then it has to be submitted. That's how they know that you are interested. Now, another stream of popularity is the human capital priorities stream, which is on the next slide. Um, this doesn't truly give you as much control over selected over being selected the same way because you're going to be entered into the express entry. That's the first thing that you must do. Um, you have to be a skilled worker, a federal skilled worker or part of the Canadian experience class. So for someone who's a federal skilled worker, there's a certain not code that you have to have in your work experience, which is zero A or B. This can be found on the not code website. And so examples I can give is maybe you're in a managerial, a financial industry, you can be um, an administrator, uh, like an admin person, for example. So some of those occupations fall within those different not codes. And the not code also applies under the Canadian experience class as well. It just means that you have experience working in Canada in those fields. Now your education has to be a bachelor degree or higher, and it could be obtained inside or outside of Canada. Any education for most programs, any education that's completed outside of the country, you do have to do an educational assessment. So there are a few, there's West World Education Services that does an assessment for you, immigration accepts it, and they'll determine where your education falls compared to Canada. Another is your language. You have to have a seven or higher, which can be done with IELTS, which does your English, or there's a French component, which I believe is listed on the slide. Um, settlement funds are required, which is also in the express entry, if that's what you're doing independently of the human capital stream. So with the settlement funds, it depends on how many family members you have they will indicate how much money you need to be able to show in a bank statement. Um, options that you have within this category is 
If you're working already inside of Canada and your salary meets the minimum requirement, then you're bypassed the bank statement. Also, if you have received a job offer and your money for that offer, your salary that's being offered, and that offer has to be in Ontario, I should be specific, the job offer has to be in Ontario. Once you meet that salary requirement, you're good to go in terms of the settlement funds. Because it is a provincial nominee program, your intention must be to live in Ontario. And you actually do have to show your connection or your reasoning for staying in Ontario so that they know this is where you intend to be. And much of the requirements that are reflected in this is also reflected in your express entry profile. There is a cost of 1,500 separate from your citizenship and immigration Canada fees that has to be paid. So at the provincial level, you have to make your payment. And then as you saw on the caregiver program, there is a list of fees that would be applicable to you on the federal um, processing fee portion. Now, I'm just making sure I went through that. So last stream I'm going to go to to address uh, for the provincial nominee in Ontario is the in-demand skills. So this stream, although it is closed, I believe this is a great option for those who are not always highly skilled in the not code 0A or B. So there's some eligible occupations that are up there on the slide that you can go through. And they also have the occupations um, for persons who are outside of the GTA. So if you just take a moment and see if any of these apply to you or may apply to somebody that you know as I go forward. Um, now, this is an employer driven category. So there are requirements for both the applicant and the employer. So first, let's start with the applicant as we go. So for the work experience, um, you must have as it's coming up. Yes, um, you must have nine months of cumulative paid full-time work experience. Now, as you saw in other programs, it would be required for you to have like a minimum of a year or two years. There's, it is more required out of you. But for this, nine months of work experience continuous, which 30 hours per week minimum is considered that full-time work experience. And your job offer has to be in one of the occupations I listed above in the previous slide. You have to have a valid license if it is required. You still have to do a language assessment, but the good news is the bench level mark is lower. It's about four. That's even lower than the caregiver program. And as well, your education only has to be high school completion. Some people don't have it and they could, if they're inside of Canada, they can always look into a GED or anything to show the equivalent of a high school completion. You must show, of course, the intention to live in Ontario and maintain legal status in Canada if you are in Canada. Your job offer has to be signed by you and your employer, and the cost of this program is $2,000 if you are inside the GTA and $1,500 if you are outside. If you've noticed, the requirements tend to be a little bit lower for any, in any category they can, for persons outside the GTA because they're really trying to stimulate people moving outside of Toronto, outside of Durham, like out of the congested areas and really move out and start um, creating job opportunities or to just get different skills in different areas so that Ontario can kind of boom more. And I, I totally understand and respect that. Um, now for the employer requirements. And you must have an active business. So the reason why I'm letting you know what the employer requirements are is because it's a great way for you to approach your, well, first see if your company that you work for or someone else that you're thinking of in regards to this works for, see if that employer or that company meets the requirements. And if they do, then you have a great way of kind of communicating to them this being a great option for them to keep you permanently. Um, I say this for persons who are already inside of Canada and they're working with these companies, or if you have a connection with somebody you're outside, you have a connection with a company who really wants to take you on, then you can see if this is something that they meet. Now, the company has to be in active business for three years minimum before submitting the application. Uh, the premises or the work location has to be in Ontario, so where the person reports to. No outstanding orders must be against that company in terms of employment standards or occupation, health, and safety. 
proof of effort to hire someone in Canada if you're offering the position to someone outside of Ontario or outside of Canada. So unless there is a positive labor market opinion that somebody has or a valid work permit in Ontario, then you would have to do this. Uh, just to make it very simple, and I didn't make it too wordy before, but if you are presently working with the company and you have a valid work permit to do so, advertising is not a requirement. If you're not working with the company and you have an open work permit or a permit inside of Canada, you are also not required to advertise the position. Uh, the revenue for the company must be $1 million minimum or $500,000 if it's outside of the GTA. And the employer must have five full-time Canadian permanent res Canadian or permanent residents working at that location or the report location. If they're outside of the GTA, the minimum is three. And there is an employer form that must be completed and signed. So I hope, I hope that was uh, understood, but I find that this is, as I said, a great opportunity sometimes for people who are under the postgraduate work permit or they're an international student, they're married and they have a spouse who may be working in a different, one of these capacities, the employer would really be able to offer them that position. What they tend to, so just to say, um, what I find as a challenge is that many employers don't want to pursue something like this because they feel they're going to have to disclose too much of their financial documents or any private business um, information that they didn't want to have to share with the third party. With this program, uh, they allow you to submit the application without those things, as long as they know uh, there's a form that you're completing, you're signing and attesting that you meet those requirements as a company. And not unless there's further auditing or further investigation that has to be done for the company in order for them to prove they need it, then they don't. They just allow the application to go forward all the way to permanent residency. So com companies sometimes are more comfortable with this avenue uh, based on not having to disclose as much. And that is something that you can use as an advantage when approaching the companies that you work or the company that you work for. Now I'd like to tackle some common misconceptions. This is our next slide. And each program discussed today. So we go to family sponsorship, and this is some of the common statements that I see here. Uh, you must be employed in order to sponsor a spouse, partner, or child. I said uh, before that you have to show that you're able to provide financially for this person, but it doesn't mean that at the time of submission, you have to be employed. So since this is not the case, it's really just showing capability. And furthermore, this has been a big challenge for people during COVID-19. Um, a lot of job loss has occurred and they want to submit the application and they feel worried about doing so if they feel it's going to be denied. So I just want to reassure you that that is not the case. You, you could include some other documentation to show that you have a financial plan. For example, a job offer letter. You could show a bank statement with some savings of any kind. You could have an explanation letter for your lack of employment, but your action plan um, in order to support that person. Um, at that point. Um, another is you cannot sponsor your dependent child until your undertaking is complete from being sponsored. So that I make it clear, um, there are persons who have been sponsored, but at the time of sponsorship, they didn't include their child to be sponsored as well. So now that they're here, they're working, but they're still undertooken by their sponsor, they're concerned that they're not able to put in the application yet for their child independently. That is not the case. They are more than able to do so. Um, it's just about showing that you have the financial capability and Many persons who are sponsoring someone don't want to take on the child as well because they would be responsible for that undertaking and they feel a little bit more comfortable if the actual parent takes on the undertaking. So that's sometimes why the situation occurs. But I want people to know, you know, if you need to seek um, advice just to know how to go about it. But yes, definitely you can submit an application for your child. Um, in the caregiver pilot program, some misconceptions that we see. 
is my employer has to advertise a position before they can offer me the job. I kind of touched on this before. This is definitely not the case. A labor market impact assessment is not needed. So no advertising. You don't have to show that you looked everywhere before you can actually hire this person. You just have to show as an employer that this is a genuine job offer and that you have the resources or the capability to cover the salary of this caregiver over the period of time that you are contracting them to work with you. Now, lastly, in this caregiver pilot uh, misconception is my sibling cannot offer me a position as a caregiver. Now, this is false because in many cases, close family members have come to Canada based on a family member providing them with the job offer. And that was through the old labor market impact assessment. Now on this present application, they do ask, are you related to this person in any way? And you would be honest and truthful, you would put that information in there, but it doesn't take away from the genuineness of the job. Remember, there is a need, and as long as there is a need, if this person qualifies for the position, there is already a built-in trust. Maybe they've worked with you before in the past somewhere. Um, you know their references are genuine, then they are more than qualified to take it on just like anybody else would. So they don't get discriminated against, but we do know that sometimes people think it's a favor. So it's just important to make sure that that person, that sibling, that cousin, that they actually meet the requirements of the job. And they're a great candidate for the position being offered. Now in our last provincial nominee uh, misconception, I cannot move to any other province after I get my permanent residence from a province. Now this is not the case, but I do wanna remind you that when you submitted the application for no matter which province it is, they do ask you, are, are you're putting in the intention to reside in that province, that you have an interest to stay in that province. And so it's very important that you're honest at that time and you do provide the information. Now, let's say circumstances change and something happens where you need to move to another province. Once you have your permanent residency, you are eligible to do so, whether you decide to do it in three years, one year or less. Um, they do evaluate to see how long the retention is in that area but it doesn't take it away from you. One thing that I do want to say as a little disclaimer is some of the categories, some of the provinces, for example, um, not provinces, programs, if you are in a business type of stream or investment type of stream, they do require after your permanent residence has been provided that you do remain within that province for a certain period of time. But if it is not stipulated ahead of time, then that is not a requirement. So feel free to move about if you have to go back go away go back but do not feel constricted because sometimes opportunities arise where you do need um, to move there is a quicker processing time this is another one this is a quicker processing time for permanent residency if it's done through the provincial nominee um, this is partially true because it really depends on the province that the processing time is happening to get the nomination decision um, so Let's say that you're doing it for Ontario. Sometimes they could give you the nomination in less than six months. Some provinces can give it to you within three weeks. So once you have that nomination certificate, you're eligible to apply for permanent residence at the federal level. So all the additional supporting documents that you have to provide for your admissibility and all the permanent resident application forms, et cetera, that goes to the federal level, you're able to do it once you have your nomination but the actual federal level processing time, in most cases, it remains the same. So everyone being placed in there is always remaining the same. The difference would be at the provincial level, if you get your nomination certificate in three weeks and you could, and your best friend got their nomination in six months, then you inevitably have the ability to submit your application sooner than allowing you to probably receive your permanent residence prior to your best friend who submitted it after because they got it six months later. So in essence, that's how the quicker processing time I find works itself out. But um, if you look at other options, if there's a family sponsorship that you had in mind, it takes around 12 months or less to be able to get your PR. So it really, and the provincial federal processing um, on average is around 24 months, maybe a little bit less. So 
each program is a bit different in terms of the processing time. Lastly, I would like to address some COVID-19 updates. Now, if you have any misconceptions that you wanna ask about in the Q&A, feel free to do so. Just write those things down and I'll try to help you as best as possible. So as we're going over some recent um, COVID-19 updates, uh, the category for family members to enter the country include those who are exclusively dating for one year and have spent time together in a physical presence at some point during their relationship. So these would be like, consider like a long distance relationship as long as it's been um, genuine and, and active for that year and you're able to prove it and you are separated based on COVID and there's travel restrictions, you are now eligible as long as you can prove that you've physically been together at some point and the fact that this relationship has been going on for more than one year, then you can have that that partner of yours enter Canada. Um, as well, they're now including grandchildren, siblings, half siblings, step siblings, and grandparents. Um, another is the postgraduate work permit holders. This is relatively new. It was as of January 27th of this year that they opened it up for applications to be submitted. So just going into it, as long as you are a postgraduate work permit holder, that is expiring within four months of the date that you're going to be applying. So you had received and we're holding your, your postgrad in 2020 and it's going to be expiring anytime soon. Then you have the ability to submit that application um, in order to extend, which is really good. You're able to extend your postgraduate work permit for an additional 18 months. I'm so happy that Canada has recognized that postgraduate workers have not been able to really succeed in the job market based on a lot of closures and limitations. So the requirement to meet for their permanent residency, if they are interested, has been taken away. And so it's really good that they're allowing persons up until July 27, 2021, to really submit these applications, get the additional time. So if you were someone who was kind of running out and you're like, I never got my year yet, I haven't done it yet really take advantage of this moment and get that work experience and be very aggressive. I know you have been, but really get aggressive and try to work something out so that you can reach your immigration goals. Lastly, um, this is an important one for many. If you are a refugee or an asylum claimant um, and you had made your claim before March 13th, 2020, and you were issued a permit after the claim, a work permit after the claim, and you worked in the healthcare related occupation, uh, there's a few occupations that I could see if Shannon could put them in, but it would be, for example, healthcare worker, personal support worker. If it was housekeeping, but related to the health industry, like a hospital or a private care home, then those are the type of occupations if you've worked in for 120 hours, minimum between March 13th and August 14th of last year. You'll be eligible to apply for permanent residence. Now this includes persons who are also denied for the hearing, but have an appeal or a stay in effect. That's like a stay order for them to be able to remain in the country. If you have been denied after this March date uh, for your hearing, it doesn't really apply for you. So these are people who were denied prior to. Um, but if you have an active case going on right now and you have been working in this industry, then you do have the option instead of going through with your claim to apply for permanent residence through this stream right now. Uh, one of the things that I know worries a lot of people, I just want to say this out there, is that if you do decide to go through this avenue, you must withdraw your claim um, from refugee. And so that may be a little hard for people because they're wondering if I go through this stream, if it doesn't work out, then I, I'm already out of the refugee. I'm stuck. I don't have anywhere to go. But truly, if this is an option that you're willing to take and you do meet the requirements, then do consider it. You're putting in your permanent residency at that time instead of waiting for your hearing to come and then it being decided from a board member. So I'm not.